Good afternoon. My name is Joe Goldberg. I'm the Cloud Practice Manager here at CCSI. And today we're going to be talking about Site Reliability Engineering. It's a uh, concept that was originally dreamed up in uh, Google and uh, it's being looked at as potentially um, an add-on or a way to um, improve on the existing DevOps culture. So uh, we'll have some, if you have any questions, just feel free to type them in in the uh, chat thing and uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can. So this, this uh, webinar is, is kind of, I guess, a call to arms. System, standard system administration is antiquated. It really doesn't scale. Um, DevOps has been a, a useful stopgap, but it didn't really fix the, the problem of moving um, administration and operations um, more in line with development. So we really need to bring those together and eliminate the toil as it were. So uh, we need to stop doing the machines work for them and uh, stop feeding them human blood. So we need to stop you know, doing what they should be doing for themselves. Um, the first concept uh, of, of Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE, is to eliminate the toil. The toil is all the day-to-day -day stuff that takes away your time from actually doing real engineering work, which um, can help benefit the company and increase productivity. This is a, a picture of, uh, in 1924, Washington, D.C. This is multiprocessing version 1.0. This is the uh, computing division in the uh, bonus bureau. These, guys, these ladies were calculating bonuses going to World War II vets. Um, but again, the, first, the, the, the primary concept or the first concept of SRE is to eliminate the toil. It's not just things that you don't like to do. You know, there's always those tasks, like I have to check the logs in the morning, stuff like that, that you don't like to do. But it's not just those. <coughs> and it's also not just all those administrative chores that you have to do. It's the kind of work that, that is manual, it's repetitive. It's stuff that really, if you had some time, you could automate it. Um, it's very tactical. It doesn't fit the strategic vision of, of the organization. It's just something that has to get done. And there's really no enduring value to it. So after you do it, you're probably just going to have to do it again. And it scales linearly. So as you keep adding more and more machines and more and more services, the amount of, of toil increases at the same rate. This is bad, especially as you start to scale up. Um, <clears throat> not all toil is bad, though. I mean, all systems have some, and you're never going to be able to get rid of all of it. But you need to be able to control it, because in large amounts, it can be toxic to an organization. It can affect morale. It can affect hiring. It can affect employee retention. It, it can be really negative if there's um, too much toil and not enough um, creative engineering work going on. <coughs> so um, this is a brief history of how Google came up with the site reliability engineering philosophy. It really came out of uh, Google's own frugality. They, uh, they don't like to spend any money that they don't have to spend, and uh, that kind of goes to an extreme. So any costs, because they're so big and they're growing so quickly, any cost that scales linearly is bad. So if I add a new server, if I have to add a new sysadmin every 10 servers, that's bad, because that's going to get very expensive very quickly. This applies to hardware. You don't want your hardware to scale linearly. And it also it applies even more to people. How do you limit the sprawl of your NOC and your sysadmins and stuff like that as much as possible? Um, software developers have started to manage the uh, continuous integration and continuous development process from development through QA and into, into uh, production. And in many DevOps environments, developers are doing operational stuff. They, um, well, you can't really say they suck at it, although they do, but part of that is because they hate it. Um, but they do, so in order to, prov to not have to do it, they build um, and automate everything that they possibly can. They build, push, and monitor, and automate all those tasks. Um, any sort of reconfiguration or environment setup, they try to automate so that they don't have to do that which they hate. 
so Google found that some of these developers were actually a little bit more production oriented than others. They actually had an understanding of the basics of networking and system administration. And they became the first site reliability engineers. So basically SREs are systems and software engineers who solve production problems with software. And I, I know everybody's heard that uh, everything is moving to infrastructure as code. Anybody who's using AWS or Azure, you, you really understand that, where your infrastructure is built out in code. And even VMware and uh, with, with all the um, SD-LAN and uh, SD-WAN capabilities is moving that direction as well. You really need to have um, a, a sound background in uh, understanding code and configuration of stuff like that. Um, but a lot of people say, well, how does Google's business relate to mine? Google is gigantic. The, no problems that they're having are going to uh, be pro like problems I have. Plus, Google has 7 million developers that they can throw at a problem. And, and they probably solved every problem that I already have. But in reality, Google's made up just of a bunch of engineers. And they're all trying to solve problems very similar to what every organization is trying to solve. They've decided that they're going to share all their successes and failures and, and hope that, you know, people will, will learn from it. But you shouldn't take what, what comes out of um, Google or the, the, their SRE process as, you know, at face value. You need to adjust it to fit your organization. You need to apply it judiciously. So you, you really, in other words, you, your mileage may vary. Don't just blindly implement you know, make sure that what you're doing fits into your organization and the way you do business. <clears throat> so SRE 101, the bottom line is, it's keep your site up whatever it takes. Um, your site is yoursite.com or your infrastructure or uh, whatever you define it to be. If the site becomes unavailable, it's our problem, whatever the reason. So if you're on an SRE team, it doesn't matter if it's a code problem, it doesn't matter if it's a systems problem, a SAN problem, a network problem, it's our problem and we're going to fix it. Uh, it has to work at scale. Many services, lots of data, and many machines. And this gets more critical as the infrastructures get larger and as people move to the cloud and even worse as you start moving to containers and microservices, some of which may be in existence for only a matter of minutes and then perform their task and then disappear. Um, you obviously can't scale people that way. You can't have one sysadmin for every, you know, 100 servers like you would in the past. Uh, you need to have something that scales sublinearly to the, the services. Uh, Facebook has, for example, one SRE for every 25,000 servers, approximately. That's a pretty good scaling rate. But even that, I'm sure they're trying to improve on because at their scale, that's still quite a lot of people. But you need to be able to balance all the competing demands of availability and reliability. You need to improve efficiency. And you also need to be able to take on new services, which has always been a challenge to operations teams. So the, again, the goal is to solve production problems with software and really just keep it all as software as much as possible. One of the key principles is the post-deployment. Most of a system's life is actually spent after release. Systems evolve after they're released, new behaviors surface, um, new deployment environments change, and there are planned upgrades and changes to functionality. All of this stuff needs to be managed, and that's where a system spends the majority of its time, not in the initial design, test, and implementation. <clears throat> the classic dev versus ops um, conundrum has been uh, around um, probably forever since there has been development and ops. And DevOps tried to bridge that gap, but still kept the two separate silos, which caused, which still causes problems. Um, they don't always need to fight, although the developers are, they want to roll out all of their new features fast. They want to see everything widely adopted. Um, operations folks value stability above all else, so they want to make sure that what they're rolling out is quality. They want to make sure that the users understand what's going on, and they, you, we need to find a balance between that because obviously we can't have developers running roughshod, throwing code up there on, a, on an hourly basis, but you also can't have operations folks stymie the uh, organization and prevent new features and uh, productivity enhancements from being rolled out. But it doesn't have to be this way. Um, SR SREs don't attempt 
to assess a risk of launch, which is kind of for an operations person, it's kind of like, what? <laughs> um, they don't set release policy and they don't try to avoid outages, which is also kind of a, a very unique way of uh, thinking about it. So what is this magic that makes them want to, makes them be able to think like that? Something called error budgets. It's one of the, the components of the SRE philosophy. Um, in order to create an error budget, you first need to understand your SLO. Your, your SLO is, is, starts out as a service level indicator, which is a quantitative measure of an attribute of the service. These are things that the users care about. Availability, latency, freshness, durability. Is, is the service available and is it usable? And then from that, you can create a service level objective, which is your service level indicator and whatever target you're trying to reach. Like, I am going to try to maintain 99.9% .9 availability, and that's my department's goal. Um, in, in contrast, there's a service level agreement, which is basically an SLO with consequences. If I don't achieve 99% availability, I get fired. Or if I don't achieve 99% avail availability, I need to pay out to my customer, you know, $1,000. So there's a consequence associated with it. Not everything needs 100% SLO. Um, obviously, a pacemaker, you would want 100% SLO. Anything less is uh, literally fatal. <clears throat> but a data center operates at significantly less than 100% SLO. It's, impo it's really impossible to achieve, achieve that. And to get even close is extremely expensive. So you have to be reasonable in your expectations. So if you use it as, a, as an example, an SLO of 99.9% .9 or commonly known as three nines, this gives you an error budget of 0.1%. So if you have, take the 100% minus the 99.9, .9, and you can choose as an SRE to spend this. So for example, if you're um, working on a system with a large database, you could say for every billion queries per month, I could have a million of them fail and still be within my budget. And that's something that you can use as you move forward with rolling out um, new features and implementing um, new capabilities. So what do you want to spend it on? Change should be the number one cause for an outage. I know that sounds kind of weird. Why do, you, why do you want to have an outage? Obviously, you want to avoid them at all costs. But if you're going to have one, it should be because, it should be because you're doing changes. You're launching... Um, you know, a new product. New product launches or new feature launches are the biggest sources of change. So you kind of have a choice. You can either spend your error budget on new launches, which give you new features, or you could spend it on service instability. I, I would rather spend my error budget on moving my product forward. The rule, if your error budget is greater than zero, launch away. Clearly your development team is doing a good job because you haven't uh, expended your error budget. If your error budget is less than zero, there's a launch freeze until you can earn back enough budget. So whether you do your error budget on a monthly basis, quarterly, however you do it, you need to earn back enough error budget to be able to move on to your next launch. <clears throat> this has two very nice features. It brings peace to the uh, development and ops organizations. It removes the major source of conflict. It's no longer an opinion of whether I think your release is going to be good or not. It becomes a math problem. Do I have enough error budget or don't I? And it's a yes or no question. And you'll find that development teams will start to police themselves because they obviously want to release and they know that they're working within the same error budget that you are. So it, it works both ways and really increases the productivity significantly. Another key component is blameless postmortems. I know this is, uh, in some organizations, there's a, a lot of finger pointing that goes on. Some organizations are very good about, um, you know, trying to learn and move forward. But an SLO of 100% means that there will be no outages. This is okay, it's not fun. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, an SLO less than 100% means that there will be outages. This is okay, you know, that's acceptable. You're not gonna achieve 100%. But the two goals for every outage is to minimize the impact and to prevent a recurrence of the problem. So your step one is to handle the event. Make sure you fix it. 
concentrate all your efforts on resolving the problem while it's active. As soon as it's over, as soon as possible, while everything is still fresh in everybody's mind, <clears throat> you should put together a postmortem. And the postmortem should be blameless. You shouldn't blame a single person or a single group within the organization. You have to assume that, that everybody is really trying their best to do their job, and, and everybody's capable of doing their job. Something just went wrong. So focus on the, the process that it's in place and the technology that's being used and see where the process can be improved. And if there needs to be a technological change, start focusing on that. Create a timeline, get all the facts, understand how the problem first started, how it was um, discovered, how long it took to resolve, the steps that were involved in resolving, and create bugs for any follow-up follow work that needs to be done. And then reset your status to, you know, I'm at a, in a green light status. You also want to make sure that as you're um, doing this, you don't want to, as they say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's still a lot of really good stuff that comes from traditional system administration and DevOps that, that shouldn't be lost when moving to uh, an SRE type of uh, environment. You definitely, on the baby side, things you don't want to throw out, you don't want to throw out the production ethic. You know, most operation teams are very proud of their ability to keep their systems up and running, and they're very proud of that ethic, that, that work ethic they have, that stop at nothing to get it fixed type thing. You don't want to uh, sacrifice troubleshooting and prob problem solving skills. You want to make sure your teams have very good troubleshooting and problem solving skills. You'd want to practice this, you know, use um, tools to simulate outages, um, you know, think like Netflix, which uses Chaos Monkey and the rest of their simian army to assume that they're always under attack and something is always breaking. <clears throat> um, build automation systems. Uh, that's just system admin 101. If you can automate it, automate it. Because if you take the uh, human error piece out of it, you'll have a much happier uh, page-free life. Um, job and system intent-based configuration management obviously helps out a lot. You need to have good monitoring systems. You need to have really strong visibility into your environments and into your implementations from the whole stack. And you need to be able to, to tie all that together to understand what's, how you're performing, what's running, what's not. And that will help you in your troubleshooting when things go wrong. You need to have strong release engineering, a, a canary a lab environment, testing and rollout. This will help um, preserve your error budget. You need good capacity planning, as, as any good organization does. And again, you need to really understand your, your SLO and your SLA definitions and monitoring. You need to understand the SLAs that are given to you by your other vendors. Um, <clears throat> they need to, you can't have an SLA that is greater than your weakest vendor. And you have to have constructive cynicism. <laughs> you need to, you know, uh, kind of approach things to, with uh, a, a little bit of, of caution. Um, don't just jump onto the next new technology bandwagon. On the bathwater side, stuff that you can definitely try to throw away is rote and repeatable work. Anything that, that is you know, consistently the same task over and over. Um, automatable work, if you can automate it, automate it. Don't, don't sit around uh, you know, doing it manually. Try to do away with as many one-offs as possible. Try to create standards, systems of standards and operate within those standards. Um, try to limit manual operating system configuration management as, as much as possible. Your system should be configured identically um, and configuration management should be an automated process through a config management tool like an Ansible or Chef. Um, logging into individual machines, if, if at all possible, this is where things go badly wrong when you have an administrator who logs into a machine and uh, does something that they may not have intended to do. Um, processing individual files and try to limit the, the, her the need for heroism, you know, for the person that stays up for 36 hours straight to try to troubleshoot a problem. And that's really um, pretty much uh, an introductory uh, into um, site reliability engineering. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we have one question that somebody was asking. 
Uh, what are the characteristics that people look for when trying to hire uh, site reliability engineers? Um, the people that you're looking for should be able to code and they should have a basic uh, good infrastructure background. They should understand the, at least the basics of networking and system administration. Obviously the more the better. And uh, they do need to have an understanding of, of how to uh, code in preferably whatever languages your organization programs in so that they can assist in troubleshooting code-based issues. And also they should have some of the, the more standard languages that are used in uh, infrastructure like Python um, and I guess if, uh, Ruby if you're using something like Chef. I don't see any other questions. So uh, if, if anybody needs any additional information or assistance in, in any of the, uh, implementing any of these, you should feel free to reach out to CCSI. We have uh, a very strong cloud and cybersecurity practice and uh, infrastructure as well. And uh, 24 by seven knock and sock here in Bohemia. And uh, we'd be happy to assist you in anything that you need. So looking forward to our next webinar.